If you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome. In modern America, we are taught to get loud, to be disruptive and confrontational when we encounter something that we think is wrong. Really? Is that who we are? Everyone in life has to deal with disappointment, hardship, and yes, injustice, and not fake injustice, real instances of being treated unfairly. But there is a more effective and dignified way to handle such things. Today, we'll consider an alternative to the get-in-your-face culture that our society celebrates. I'm Julie Hartman, and this is Timeless. <laughs> everyone, welcome to Timeless. It's great to be with you as always. As a reminder, please hit the subscribe button down below so that you can stay notified every time we post new videos. We do Dennis and Julie on this channel here on Mondays. It premieres at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern. Timeless is Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And then throughout the week, I will post Julie noted news videos on the most important timely subjects of our week. So, Please do check that out, all of those uh, different forms of content, not just this timeless show. You can also follow me at Julie R. Hartman on Instagram and Twitter, and you can email me at julie at julie-hartman.com. There have been a lot of articles recently in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, even published by the CDC, that deal with the ever-growing problem of American anxiety. And these articles talk about how Many Americans, not just young people, because typically we think, is, think of young people as being the most depressed, which is certainly true, but these articles talk about how Americans in general are feeling more anxious and more depressed. Our suicide rate is at a record high, tragically, and so there have been a lot of articles that are trying to explain why this is happening. And as someone who has observed this myself, especially among my age group, I love reading these articles to try to figure out what is behind this uptick in anxiety. Because we have all of the earmarks or hallmarks of success. We're very affluent as a society, certainly compared to other times and places on earth. There is a really a great, more hospitable, um, way of, of advancing yourself in society. For instance, it used to be that you could only get a good education if you went to a certain caliber of university, but there are many, many universities nowadays, including community college, which offer the same level of education as, and perhaps even better uh, education than our top tier universities. We haven't been in a major war in several decades, so it's fascinating to consider that as we have all of the earmarks and hallmarks of success, we are extremely depressed and anxious. And a through line of all of these articles which talk about this phenomenon is that they list these similar, or in some cases identical, purported reasons for the uptick in anxiety. Here are the main ones that I've noticed again across the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CDC, et cetera. First, people blame the pandemic. They say, well, you know, the economy was locked down for a few years and people were sent home from college and elementary school and high school. So of course people are experiencing anxiety or depression. And yeah, that makes sense. The pandemic was a terrible time, not because of the pandemic or the existence of COVID-19 itself, but because of the lockdowns, which of course these articles do not mention. They blame the, the existence of COVID-19 as opposed to the uh, draconian actions that were taken as a result. So the first thing is the pandemic. The second thing that people tend to focus on is the supply or lack of supply of mental health professionals. It's interesting to see these different articles. For instance, the Wall Street Journal says that a reason that we're seeing an uptick in, in anxiety is because we have a lot of screening and a lot of mental health professionals surveying the population. And then the CDC says the exact opposite, that there aren't enough. And that's why we're seeing this big problem because we need more resources to be allocated to diagnose people. A third reason that I see cited a lot is political anxiety. 
with Donald Trump coming to office and the January 6th insurrection and the rampant white supremacy and bigotry, people are feeling so anxious about the future. Do with that what you will. And then the fourth big reason is social media, that people are comparing each other online and it makes them sadder. And look, if you look at any of these four reasons, some of them are totally legitimate. As I mentioned, especially the lockdowns slash pandemic. And I would also say the social media culture. But if you look at each of those four, there's a theme. And that is that it externalizes the problem. It makes it seem like there are these outside forces that are contributing to this malaise. And in some cases that is accurate, but it ignores that a lot of this depression and this anxiety is a crisis from within. It is something that needs to be solved by you and your outlook and your worldview as opposed to anything else outside of you. And this is precisely the problem. It's interesting because these articles that talk about the various reasons for our sadness and malaise, they are referencing the problem, but they are also perpetuating and creating the problem by blaming everything on these external factors. Because the problem really is that our society is reducing the worth of the human being by creating this narrative that the human being is someone who is acted upon. That we are just acted upon by the pandemic or COVID-19, and that is what is making us depressed. That we are being acted upon by these external political forces or this external technological reality of social media. That reduces, as I said, the worth of the human being because it just makes us seem like we are helpless in the face of societal onslaught. Now, of course, in some ways that is true, but it is not really true. We do have the power, especially in the United States of America, to overcome these external problems, to overcome our circumstances. That is not true of a lot of people in different parts of the world. I talk a lot about the plight of women in Iran. I bet a lot of people who are not of my political persuasion listening to me would think that I am supportive of a patriarchal society. I am so upset by actual patriarchy that I talk about Iran almost every show. Women are totally, completely abused in Iran. They really can't help but, but, but succumb to that because they will be arrested if they fight back against the regime. And in many cases, including in Iran, it is difficult to overcome your circumstances, but that is not true in the United States. And how ironic that in the country where it is actually possible to triumph over these external things. We have indulged in this societal attitude that we are somehow beneath or beholden to these circumstances. So there's this reduction in the worth of the human being. It's making us out to be people who are just acted upon. And I wanna give a few examples that we hear just every day, and we may not even realize that they are examples of this phenomenon, but they are. For instance, the idea that poverty causes crime. We hear that a lot with people who argue that we should get people out of prisons and defund the police. In other words, these individuals are trying to say it's not the fault of the person who's committed the crime, it is the fault of the family or the neighborhood in which they were born in. Again, that makes the human being seem like they are being acted upon by something external to them. We hear often that white supremacy is rampant in our culture, that it is hiding behind every corner. Someone with whom you may be interacting may have a latent white supremacist urge that is coming out in these microaggressions. The way that we learn in school, whether it be history or mathematics or English, have these innuendos of racial superiority embedded into them. That makes you feel like there is some insidious creeping demon that is out to impede on you. And it takes away your agency as a human being. The war on merit that we are seeing is also this diminishment of the self. United Airlines recently announced that 50% of its pilots in the next five or 10 years, however long they put it, would be women or people of color, 50%. That has a way of making the human being feel like no matter how hard they work, 
no matter what good grades or accomplishments they get, they may get to the end of the rainbow of pilot school or any other endeavor that they are embarking on, and they will be passed over because of the immutable traits that they were born to. They will be passed over because they are a cisgender white male. That takes away human beings' agency because what is the incentive to succeed based on merit? What's the incentive to work hard if you feel like all of your efforts are going to be for naught because of these things that you can't control? In schools, there is this new in vogue thing, which actually is happening at my old high school, which is really sad. I loved my old high school, but I didn't go to my five-year reunion, and I often don't associate with the high school in general. For instance, I don't donate because I'm so disgusted by this thing that they are doing, and that is that they allow students in certain classes to retake tests. In certain districts of California public schools, for instance, in Oregon public schools, they say that it is equity to allow students to retake tests. The Oregon Department of Education, in addition to that absurdity, also says that finding one right answer in mathematics is apparently white supremacy. That is indicating that you are so helpless. You have no abilities to work hard to succeed on an exam or to succeed in the discipline of mathematics that you have to succumb to the, these lowerings of standards in order for you to actually pass the, the class that you're in or even graduate from high school. There are so many other examples. Safe spaces itself takes away the agency of human beings because it makes it seem like you are just going to go out and be offended and you don't have any control as to react to that appropriately, so you need this safe space to crawl to in order to make yourself feel better as a human being. There's also a uh, new law in Canada, which is truly terrifying, and it's called medically assisted suicide. And in Canada, what they do is that they allow you, if you have a irredeemable or irreparable mental or physical ailment, ailment, excuse me, they allow you to take your own life. The only uh, sort of mechanism to maybe slow that process down is that you need to get the approval of two doctors. Those doctors have to say that you are mentally competent enough to make the decision to take your own life, which in and of itself is so sickly ironic and twisted because of course a person who is opting to take their own life is not mentally competent to make such a decision. The fact that they would even want to do such a thing is indicative of a lack of mental competence. But that also makes a human being out to be someone who was just acted upon by depression or by these illnesses that have afflicted them. There's no sense of a human being being able to overcome those external problems. The, ma the um, medically assisted suicide law essentially says you have to succumb to them. There's no hope. There's no choice. That's your only way out. The whispering undertone of all of those things that I just mentioned, whether it be poverty causes crime or white supremacy is around every corner or you will get chosen on the base of your sexuality or your race or you're allowed to retake tests or even take your own life if you want to, the whispering undertone of each of those statements is I don't believe in you. I don't believe in you. I don't think that you can be superior to your circumstances. I don't think that you can control yourself. I don't think that you can improve yourself. I don't believe in you. What an insult that is. And that is what we are facing all the time from from leaders in the way that they speak to us, from, from educators, etc. It is this creepy and deeply insulting belief that we are just somehow these people who are helpless. That is not who we are. This has been bubbling up for some time. Certainly it's hit its climax, if you will, in 2023 or in the 21st century. But these ideas that the human being is just acted upon, that we have no power over these things that are external to us, this has been growing and growing for many centuries now. 
I do this great uh, once monthly uh, segment here on the show, Timeless, with Spencer Clavin, who is the author of How to Save the West. He's a senior editor at the Claremont Review of Books, which is my favorite publication. It's actually a magazine. And he's the host of the Young Heretics podcast. And we have talked about this this, uh, phenomenon that over time there has been this idea that you are helpless to your circumstances. We do a thinker of the month episode uh, once a month, so please do look out for that. Freud is one of these thinkers. Sigmund Freud, I believe, is from the 19th century. And he talked about how you are basically a collection of your sexual impulses. The way that you were potty trained as a child, the way that you were dealt with by a certain parent informs whether you will be a person who is more soft and kind or someone who is more disciplined and um, unbendable to certain um, uh, cultural things that are pushing you in a certain direction. In other words, Freud basically said that your personality can be determined by the way that you were potty trained. So in other words, you don't have any control over yourself. It was just whatever parent you happen to be born to and the way that they decided to deal with you informs your outcome in life. Rousseau came a little bit earlier than Freud, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He's from the 18th century, so the 1700s. He is a Genevan philosopher who Spencer and I talked about last month, so in the month of August. He was our thinker of the month. And Rousseau essentially said that human beings were born perfect in the state of nature. And then over time, as society and civilization advanced, there were certain things such as competitiveness and division of labor and the pursuit of economic wealth that corrupted human beings and took us away from that perfect state of nature and made us these terrible creatures today. In other words, if you see a human being acting out, it's not because there's something malignant in them that they have not controlled that is causing them to act out. It's because they are constantly being pushed in a bad direction by society and civilization itself. And the final example I'll give, though there are so many more of these thinkers, is Karl Marx. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the two authors of the Communist Manifesto in, uh, published in 1848, talked about men as economic creatures, that you are pushed by impulses to be wealthy, to have control over others. And that is what characterizes a human being. So again, we've seen these intellectual currents building and building and building for some time. And now it just has erupted in every political slogan, it seems, or many of the practical, educational, or governmental things that are enacted that reflects this belief of, the human being can't control his or herself. So that provides a transition into the big topic of today, which is how to deal with hardship. Because if you look at all of these examples that I've given, whether it's poverty causing crime, this you, you can retake tests in schools, you, can, you have to go to a safe space in order to prevent yourself from being so hurt by all of the offensive external things. All of that reflects how we deal with hardship. Each of those things pertain to how the human being has to encounter things that are difficult. And if you look at the way that we are taught about how to deal with such difficulty, it shows just how much people think of the human being as having no agency and the human being as being something that is just acted upon. Because a la Maxine Waters in the introduction of this episode, we are encouraged and taught to react to disappointment and injustice as if we are kind of animals. We're supposed to get loud and get confrontational and get in people's faces and be disruptive. That's like a dog. <laughs> it's like you take your dog to a park and they see another dog who, I don't know the way dogs think, but maybe your dog thinks that's a cuter dog or the dog is getting more attention from its owner and, and the dog starts growling and barking. That's how a dog reacts to difficulty or disappointment or injustice or hardship. That's not the way a human being should react to those things. Or a baby, if a baby wants a cookie or the baby doesn't like that his or her mommy is not paying attention to them, 
the baby will start screaming and yelling and crying and being disruptive. Is that who we are? Is that how we are really supposed to react to those things? Or is it that part of being an adult and a mature human being is the fact that we can exercise control and we don't have to succumb to animalistic or primitive impulses. It's a very bizarre thing that our society is encouraging and condoning and celebrating those impulses. So we played the Maxine Waters clip. I wanna show you a few more examples just to illustrate how common this is in modern day America, that it is triumphant and somehow ennobling to act out. This first clip is actually from an event where yours truly was in attendance. This was the Harvard-Yale football game in 2019 where uh, tens if not hundreds of students stormed the field, stopped the game to protest the existence of fossil fuels. In a, uh, a protest of some sort and took a seat at the midfield area and you see that authorities from both the, the campus and also the uh, city of New Haven were there. And then as, uh, as it started, both teams eventually went to their respective locker rooms here at the Yale Bowl. That interrupted the game for about 40 to 50 minutes. I remember it was really not fun, but it's what you're supposed to do because climate change is such a big deal. And the way that you be a modern day leader at especially a privileged school as Harvard and Yale, is that you storm the field. Nothing is more important to this existential threat to our existence. Take another example of climate change protests, if you can even call it that. There was this trend a few months ago of people going to museums and splattering paint or throwing mashed potatoes on some of the most famous treasured pieces of art. Art or activism? Two climate activists put red handprints on a famous Claude Monet painting that was on display in Sweden. Then they glued themselves to the protective glass covering the artwork. Their point was to protest the need to ban peat mining and restore the wetlands. The pair were arrested. Monet's work was unharmed. See, by the way, even the way that the narrator of that video is talking about the event, it, the fact that this, this, this narrator is not expressing outrage is really telling because of course this is what humans being, human beings do. They, they get loud and they get disruptive and they protest. If we were of our right minds and we were reacting appropriately to these things, a narrator such as that individual would be saying, look at these animals, look at these freak shows who, are, who have the audacity and who are so frankly mentally ill as to go into a museum and vandalize and ruin this painting. But no, you have to talk about it in this way, art or activism. Art or activism, are you kidding? What about it is art? What about it is activism? It is animalistic savagery. Another example, and I could name many more, but I think you get the point, is when Ben Shapiro was protested at California State University, Los Angeles. Let's look at how people protested him. They're, they're trying to bring people in three at a time. They're trying to bring them in through the back door. They're trying to make sure that people have access but there's only so much that they can do when the president of this university who shut down this event in the first place. I wish the people who were protesting would be able to see that they are actually degrading themselves by their behavior. Why? Because A, they're showing that the situation has control over them. They are actually giving credence to the supposed white supremacist of Ben Shapiro by becoming so loud and fanatical and violent and angry. It is showing that that quote unquote white supremacist, I don't think Ben Shapiro's a white supremacist do confirm, but I'm going along with what they think. They are showing that that quote unquote white supremacist has such control over them that they have to resort to animalism and convulsion in order to deal with the threat of that individual. So it actually, the joke is kind of on you because you're showing that the thing that is bothering you so much has so much power that you can't help but behave in a dignified way. And also, you just become an angry and bitter and diminished person 
as a result of behaving in such a way. That's the thing about evil. You know, when people are doing evil, when they are acting in ways that are not in accordance with what they know to be right, they don't realize that they are basically the victims of evil as much they are the perpetrators. For instance, when someone says, oh, well, I have a right to behave poorly. I have a right to scream and yell and throw a baseball at a window and shatter glass because I am combating this wrong thing, i.e. this injustice, i.e. This, this bigot Ben Shapiro. They don't realize that they are not just perpetrating evil, but evil is acting on them. They are becoming diminished and bitter and angry as a result. So it's not just that they are doing the action, but they are going to a lower level because of their action. If you look at some of the most famous art heists or bank heists, you'll see that a through line of those is that there are some people who think that they are in on the deal, i.e. in on the art heist, they're one of the perpetrators, but they are actually being used up by some people at the top. Whereas these mobsters, for instance, recruit like two or three people to help them rob this bank. And the two or three people think, oh, I'm going to get, you know, an equal share of the money as the mobster. But it turns out that they are just being manipulated by the mobster. The mobster has entrusted them to do the dirty work. And then at the end of the day, the head honcho is going to pocket all the money and those people are being used. That's the same thing with evil. When you are behaving poorly, you think you're the winner. You think you're in on the plan because you're making other people suffer, but you don't realize that you too are being used because you are becoming this lesser person of the, of the kind of individual you would want to be. There is an alternative, believe it or not, to this kind of animalistic behavior. It's a more restrained and dignified way of going about things. And it actually works out better long-term not only for yourself, but also for the evil that you are trying to combat. Before we get to this alternative, I would like to tell you about an alternative to maybe the terrible pillow that you are sleeping on. And that is my pillow. I use many my pillow products, including the my pillow, the Giza Dream bed sheets, the towel sets, and even the my slippers. I walk in every day to work wearing the my slippers because they are so comfortable, much more comfortable than heels. And then at the last minute, I just change into the heels that you see on the camera today. You can get all of these products at a discount if you use the promo code Hartman, which is my last name spelled H-A-R-T-M-A-N. For a limited time, you will get 60% off of the Giza Dream bed sheets. That comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty if you use the promo code Hartman. On top of that, with any order for a limited time, you'll get Mike Lindell's soft cover book free with the promo code Hartman. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Hartman or call 1-800-566-6745 and you guessed it, use the promo code Hartman. So there is an alternative way of dignity and restraint. And in order to illustrate or effectively argue of that alternative way, I'm going to reference one of my favorite books, which is Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre was written in the mid 19th century by Charlotte Bronte. And they, Jane Eyre has some passages that really deal with this idea well. How do, how do uh, face hardship or disappointment or injustice in a way that is appropriate and not degrading. One of the things I love about Jane Eyre as a book is that in Jane Eyre, the protagonist, Charlotte Bronte, the author, gives you a person to admire. In so many modern day books or TV shows or movies, you have a protagonist who is deeply flawed. For instance, the progenitor of this deeply flawed protagonist idea was the book um, Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, where Holden Caulfield is the narrator and he's an unreliable narrator. And basically the whole book is about the fact that he cannot see things clearly and he's having a mental breakdown about growing up. You know what? There's something to be said for acknowledging that people go through these things and the people are flawed. But the problem is 
we've gotten so far that our culture is now idolizing or making the the central centerpiece of their work, their their books, their movies, and their TV shows, this flawed character that sometimes we're left as a viewer with, well, who do we agree with? Who do we admire? And in Jane Eyre, Jane is someone who behaves so well, who molds herself over time, becoming a better person that you really do admire her. It's not that she was always perfect, as I'm about to show you, she wasn't, but she really followed a certain path that gives you someone to look up to so that you may be able to do that yourself. And by the way, just as a quick note, Jane Eyre also has all of these other characters who are flawed. So it's not that Charlotte Bronte is painting a perfect picture of humanity, but it's really important to have a good example in life of someone that you want to emulate. And Jane Eyre is that girl for me, that person for me. So let's look here at some of these great passages that instruct us on how to deal with hardship, with dignity. Jane, growing up, when you, when you read the first page of the book, you're brought into this scene, which is that Jane is an orphan, and she was, both of her parents died, and she was sent to live with her aunt and her cousins. Her aunt is a widow, and her cousins are horrible. Her aunt is also horrible. And they treat Jane so poorly. They blame her for everything that goes wrong. It's sort of like Cinderella and the evil stepmother and the evil stepsisters. She is the scapegoat for everything. They lock her in one of these rooms one night. It's just, it's just a terrible upbringing for this poor girl. And understandably, Jane becomes very angry and resentful. And growing up, she lashes out at her aunt and she says, I don't love you because her, her aunt says that, that one time accuses Jane of being a liar. And Jane says, if I were a liar, I would say that I loved you and I don't love you. You are a wicked, horrible person who has made my life hell. So she, according to modern day culture, fulfills the idea of being the disruptive, loud in your face activist of confronting evil by being basically a volcano and exposing it and getting angry because it is worthy of that anger. But we see that actually Jane becomes diminished as a result of that anger. It's not that the aunt or the cousins does, don't deserve it, but it says something about Jane and her development in a, in a, in a not so great way that she goes down this path. She ends up going to an orphanage, uh, this, it's called Lowood School for Girls, and her aunt and her cousins can't deal with her, so they send her away. And there Jane encounters this lovely, pious fellow orphan named Helen Burns. And Helen is the person who really teaches Jane to deal with that hardship in a different way as opposed to lashing out. And the way that Helen shows Jane how to deal with it in a different way is that she leads by example. Because at the orphanage, Helen Burns is relentlessly scapegoated, relentlessly ridiculed and targeted by certain instructors. There's just one evil teacher, Mrs. Scafford, and she singles out Helen as the person who she wants to punish. And so Jane one day goes up to Helen and she says, how do you deal with that? How are you so stoic and you don't lash out, you don't yell. When Mrs. Scafford is, is punishing you, you just stand there like a martyr, really, and deal with it gracefully. Aren't you so angry, Helen? How do you maintain your composure? And Helen has this great response to Jane, which among many other reasons, my friends, is why you need to read the book. You think of a book like Jane Eyre as being, oh, this relic of 200 years ago that deals with matters that we have no relation to. That is not true. These books are treasures because people have lived before us. They have encountered the human experience before us. And people who are as brilliant as Charlotte Bronte are giving us a roadmap of how we might be able to deal with it in a more effective, efficient way than they did, including how to deal with hardship. So Helen says to Jane, life appears to me to be too short, spent in nursing animosity, registering wrongs. I love that. That's so true. Because again, if you allow that evil teacher or whoever that person is that is quote unquote oppressing you to make you react in such a terrible way, you are giving that person power. 
Helen urges Jane too to not succumb to the indulgence of resentment. I think that line is so great. The indulgence of resentment. We think of an indulgence as eating chocolate late at night when you know that you shouldn't or having a drink at a time that maybe you shouldn't. No, resentment is as much as an indulgence as filling other more positive impulses because resentment is an impulse as much as craving candy is. And there's this line after Jane lashes out at her aunt and it shows this, the fact that, that in, resentment is an indulgence. Jane says, quote, again, after she, she yelled at her aunt, something of vengeance I had tasted for the first time. It seemed on swallowing, warm and racy, but its after flavor, metallic and corroding, gave me a sensation as if I had been poisoned. That is so true. Letting your fury out in the moment is kind of like drinking. In the moment, it makes you feel really good. It gives you a false sense of hubris. It makes you feel like you're on top of the world. For instance, those people who we saw throwing paint at a, at a famous piece of art probably in the moment thought, I'm so great, I'm so defiant. I just ruined this artwork in the face of my principles, i.e. combating climate change. So in the moment, it's a good thing and you feel great. But then afterwards, like drinking, you get a bit of a hangover. You realize that it maybe wasn't the best thing for you to do and you feel terrible as a result of your actions. So Helen is the one that alerts Jane to, to this idea that actually you're going to feel worse after and the way that you shirk this disappointment is that you don't give the person who's perpetrating so much control over you. She says, if you go about life this way, revenge will not worry your heart. Degration will not too deeply disgust you and injustice won't crush you too low. That's exactly right. If you put it into a worldview that injustice or things that are not right are a part of life, you can use that as an opportunity for transformation and an opportunity to triumph over those things that are trying to drag you down. But the problem is in modern day America, we think of injustices as being these terrible things. And of course they are terrible, but we think of them as being a, a bad part of life. Like this wasn't a part of the game that we signed up for. Well, it was actually, if we realize that, that everyone in life has to deal with these things, people won't be so outraged by injustice. They won't feel so, uh, like it is so necessary to yell and to scream. They will realize that this is a part of life and actually a moment that could make you better. So, Basically, Jane ends up going back to her aunt's house years and years later when her aunt is dying, this evil aunt who she ran away from. And you can see Helen's influence on her in the way that she deals with this evil aunt. She's sitting by her bedside as this aunt, Mrs. Reed, is dying. And Mrs. Reed is essentially yelling at Jane again, like she was nine years old all over again. And she's saying, you were this wicked child. You so oppressed me. You so worried me. I hated you. You were a burden, etc." And Jane is sitting there knowing that it's all BS, knowing that, that actually Mrs. Reed was the evil tyrannical one and not Jane. But yet Jane approaches her flailing with a kind of stoicism and restraint and dignity that gives her control over the situation. She says, I'm so sorry that I may have hurt you because this woman is dying. What is the point of her being disruptive, confronting injustice the way that Maxine Waters would want us to confront injustice? What would be the point of Jane yelling at her evil aunt in her final hour? It wouldn't, it wouldn't do anything to change the situation and it would just make Jane worse off. And she talks about this, Jane reflects. She says, nine years ago, I walked down the path to this home. I had left a hostile roof with a desperate and embittered heart. I still feel like I'm a wanderer on the face of the earth. But this time I experienced firmer trust in myself and my own powers and less withering dread of oppression. The flame of resentment has been extinguished. You think that you are just you, you think that you're making the other person's life hell 
by getting loud and getting angry and confronting them, but you're actually just making your life hell because that person isn't going to change. When the flame of resentment was extinguished in Jane, she was happier because, quote, I no longer felt like she had the power over me that she once possessed. This is a great story for so many reasons, including the fact that Helen Burns was the person that shaped Jane away from this spiteful person in towards this this very even-tempered person. And later on in the book, you see Jane is not treated well. And it's not that she is a coward in the face of this. The point isn't to just shirk and hide in the shadows in the face of things that you don't like. But there's a kind of dignity that you ought to approach things with. And it shows you that the most effective thing that you can be is a good example. A good example to the people who are not treating you well. A good example to others who may be the victim of that mistreatment. The most effective advertising campaign for you and your position is if you maintain your calm and your cool and you set a good example. So that brings us to the final part of the episode. And I want to tell you a little story of when I completely realized this and it actually happened in the past month. Many of you know that I went to Berlin and I talked a lot about my time in Berlin and all of the World War II and Cold War history that I uh, saw there. I did an episode on the show Timeless called Berlin. We did a Dennis and Julie episode about it. I really encourage you to check it out because it's great. Because I talk about Berlin so much, people may not know that I actually went to London before Berlin. And I went to Westminster Abbey as part of my uh, sightseeing field trips. I'm very lucky to have been to London a few times in my life, and I believe I've been to Westminster Abbey two or three times before. But I love going back because every time I go, I discover something new. The, the place is a treasure. It is a treasure itself, and it is filled with treasures because you walk in, and, and you'll just be like walking down some corridor, and you'll look down and go, oh, I'm standing on where Charles Darwin was buried. Isn't that amazing? the father of Darwinian evolution, so much for better or for worse of, of how our culture has been shaped. He's just buried in this abbey. You walk down another corridor, you'll see the remnants of Geoffrey Chaucer, who was that great English writer. You'll go down five other corridors and encounter centuries and centuries of kings and queens in Britain. There's this beautiful artwork and stained glass. I can't, I can't hype it up enough. It is my favorite place on earth, not one of, but the favorite place on earth. Anyway, about a month ago, I was in Westminster Abbey and I decided to try to explore parts of the Abbey that I didn't know as well. Because if you put on those earphones or you take your little map, they lead you to the tourist attractions, to the graves of the famous people. But I wanted to go down some other corridors that I had not ventured into. And I had probably one of the most moving experiences of my life doing that, as corny as it sounds, because I looked at the graves, not of kings and queens, not of evolutionists and artists and architects, but of regular people. Because Westminster Abbey's been around for like many centuries, and there were people who commissioned to have their children or their mothers or their brothers buried in that abbey. These are people who we view as anonymous citizens who died of typhus or who died for the British Empire sailing on a ship. And so no one goes down those corridors, but I thought, why not? I'll just go look at some of their graves. And they had these inscriptions on the graves. You would think at a place like Westminster Abbey, it would be Sir Luke John, Elder the Third, son of this duke or relation of, you know, the king of England. Yes, there was some of that. But the inscriptions on these graves actually had nothing to do with the people's background or, or heritage. The inscriptions almost exclusively talked about that person's character. And they talked about how certain individuals dealt with hardship and injustice and disappointment. I'll read to you some. This one person who was buried on his gravestone and said that he was a loving son to his heartbroken, widowed mother. Now, in modern day America, you would think, why would that even be something that you would be put on a grave, that would be put on a grave? Shouldn't you put the person's race and their sexuality and where they went to college and where they worked and what, you know, activist organizations they were a leader of? That's how we think of things, but no. 
this was so much a part of who this person was, their character, that they were so loving and dutiful to their mother in her depression that it was worthy of going on the gravestone. There was another person who died prematurely, as many of those interred in the Abbey were, and it says, he had unblemished conduct in every relation of life. With manners gentle and prepossessing, he attained the esteem of all who witnessed his brilliant life. Wow, what a beautiful thing to, to have on your grave. There was a woman who died. She was about 20 or 21 years old. And it says that the Almighty, God, took her amid a lingering and painful disease, which she endured with fortitude and Christian resignation. And then a final one I'll read to you. For those who are watching, you see I'm taking out my phone. Probably the first time I've ever done that on a Timeless episode. And this person was also prematurely <laughs> faced their death, has an inscription that reads, actuated by a lively sense of religion. He enjoyed that serenity of mind and cheerfulness of temper by which Christianity so peculiarly distinguishes us. His extensive bounties were dispensed with liberal but secret magnificence, seldom disclosing even to those whom they relieved the source whence they flowed. Public institutions, distressed individuals, private friends, experienced the benefit of his well-regulated economy, demonstrating that though he had shrunk from the hurry of the world, he had not forgotten his most important duties. As I walked through the Abbey, <laughs> reading these inscriptions, people probably thought I was nuts because I'm tearing up and I'm taking pictures of everything. People are probably looking at me like, the famous people are over there. Julie Hartman, what are you doing taking pictures of these anonymous citizens? But I felt a strange emotion for being in a place of death, and that was envy. I read these inscriptions, and I wished that I had known these people, not because of their earl or duke or lord status or whatever college they went to or, or whatever town in England that was particularly affluent that they grew up in, because, but because... They seemed to deal with the hard parts of life with dignity and stoicism and respect. And it was then that I really realized that your character, especially in times of challenge, is more than anything else in your life, your greatest accomplishment. So thank you all very much for being here. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Reminder to hit the subscribe button down below if you did enjoy it so that you can stay abreast of the new uh, content that we put out. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>